This episode is sponsored by Lupton Capital, which provides a variety of investment services to both retail and institutional investors on platforms such as Seeking Alpha, Substack, and StockTwits. For more information on these services or for links to those services, please visit LuptonCapital.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Investing with the Whales podcast. My name is Jonah Lupton. I am your host. And today we have Bradley Freeman. Substack writer, author of The Stock Market Nerd. Brad, what's up, man? Not too much. Just uh, cranking out some investor conferences and reading transcripts and, and another another fun week, but really excited to be here. Thanks for having me and excited to talk. Go blue. Go blue. Yes. Go blue, go blue, go blue. Uh, We're Michigan guys, if, if no one knows what that means. So um, how, would you, how would you describe your investing style for people that aren't familiar with you? Sure. I think... Um, in, in the most cliche term possible and overused term, but it, it's, it's really growth at a reasonable price. So I seek out the disruptors. I seek out the innovators. I seek out the structural compounders that are, that are going to deliver 10, 15, 20, 30% growth over the long term. But I really love, um, I, I really love the profitable compounders and, and, and the, the compounders where you're, you're not, you're, you're, you know, that maybe external marketing and, and just more costs and more spend aren't the only thing powering their growth. And they've actually shown you a little bit of operating operating leverage and shown you that, yeah, we can rapidly compound. We can do it with a, with a rational cost structure. So I think, and maybe we'll talk about this company because I know you're a big fan, but Uber is, is a phenomenal example of that, of just um, a company that I mean, maybe with new management and, and I don't want to get too far into that yet. And, and I'll, I'll let you ask, but um, just, just companies that, that, that have, have shown you an ability um, to be responsible and, and to be frugal with their growth and, and not just a growth at any price or growth at any cost mentality. Um, but one where um, you actually have some some pretty stable margins and some pretty sizable margins. So you know when these companies enter a more mature phase of their life cycle, the profits are going to be there because they're already there and, and they can just rationalize further. Um, but but these companies may be born in 2020 and 2021 where um, it, it was growth at, at, at any price. And, 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 and I do have a few of those names in my portfolio, but they're, they're pretty rare at this point. Um, that, that's, really, that's really where I'm looking. The, they're reasonably priced. Um, profitable compounders, which which I know are are, are very rare, so um, it's it's fun to just to just dig through markets and, and to find them. It's almost like a treasure hunt. So like reasonably priced, probably means different things to different people. I usually look at like peg ratios. Um, like there are large cap stocks right now in the Dow Jones that have peg ratios of like four x, right? You know, like a Johnson and Johnson, Procter and Gamble, probably trading it you know, 25 times earnings, probably growing earnings at five or 6% a year. Like I could never, ever get on board with that. You know, those are companies that are going to grow, you know, compound in my portfolio at 20, 25, 30% a year, but an Uber will, you know, or at least I think it will, you know, especially with a disciplined CEO like Dara, a massive addressable market. And the fact that they're like, sucking the life out of Lyft. <laughs> I mean, Lyft is like borderline bankrupt at this point because Uber is just so much better in every way and continues to add more services to their platform. So let's start with Uber. I know Uber is a position you started recently. What did you like about the company? Why did you jump in? And like when you jump into a new position, how long do you think you're going to hold it? Yeah, yeah, and I th- I'm probably going to say a lot of the things that 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 you you've already are already told your listeners. So I, I apologize if there's any repetition here, but I'm assuming there's some overlap in the bull case. But um, so under Travis Travis Kalanick, the, the founder and and that that really that really entertaining um, documentary on on, on on Netflix that came out, which was so so fascinating. But I mean, they built an absolutely massive book of business, and they did it in a pretty shady way. Um, which made them, I, I guess, inherently more difficult to compete with because he was vicious and, and he was um, do whatever I can to succeed and, and whatever I can to get ahead of the competition, which which was was Lyft in North America when they were a one country um, operator. But Dar really came in and had this gigantic book of revenue and just just in, insanely bloated cost base of um, we're trying to build out autonomous vehicles all on our own and then do everything all on our own and and it really. There was all of this low hanging fruit, and Airbnb is another company that that um, I, I kind of saw in this bucket a, a year or two ago. But just just all all of this massive book of revenue and all of these levers it could pull um, to to grow margins and to grow profit per ride and to do things just in a more rational way. And they were, um, they were, they were trying to grow in like China, Russia, everywhere around the world, you know, all off of one balance sheet. Yeah, it was it was buy revenue and pay whatever we need to pay to buy revenue. And what that led to was a massive business with absolutely no profits to show for it and no no real path to profitability. 
And Dara kind of came in and said, okay, we, we, we have established um, leading market share in, in all these countries. We have established this massive book of business. Now we can kind of, um, now, now we can kind of do so in a more rational way. And, and you've seen them pull back on marketing, pull back on these really speculative projects that, that had a very low probability of success while they continue to grow market share in pretty much every country in their core market. And, and while they now continue to expand much more rationally into, into new product categories, which is the other really compelling part of the investment that I love, which is it's Uber One. And, and it's it's sort of the, the Amazon Prime playbook, but I hesitate to compare things to Amazon because I know people will roll their eyes at me. But it, it's basically in, in, this, in this world of um, commoditized ride sharing, it's tucking in as many services as you, as you possibly can um, to generate um, cross sales, to generate better retention, to generate lower churn so that you can yeah. afford to discount. And yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Amazon Prime might be the best subscription service on the planet for the money. Like, yeah, like, yeah. I don't, even, I don't know what it is. Fifteen dollars a month. Like I'd probably pay forty dollars a month for everything you get with Amazon Prime. Yeah, and and I really think that Uber is is trying to to kind of follow it in in their footsteps, um, and and kind of create that baby marketplace where while there's all this compelling value that we can afford to offer, but Lyft can't afford to offer it because we're a, a monoline product in one country, and and we need to focus on path to profitability, like you're saying, because their balance sheet's looking a whole lot more fragile than it used to. Um, but the fact that they can tuck in all of this value allows them to, to, to aggregate these razor thin margin transactions and to build profit more meaningfully than anyone else in, in their space can. Um, and, and they've really just done a, uh, done, done a great job writing the ship and not slowing down that demand engine, but doing so well. They're now slowly before our eyes morphing into this free cash flow machine um, that, that still has a whole lot of room for operating leverage and a whole lot of room to do things better. So um, that that's where I am. I mean, throw on top of that, it's a verb. Um, I, I love investing in verbs. Just the organic virality that coincides with that is is really compelling for for efficient growth or or for a tell and a hint into how efficient that growth is going to be. So um, you were you were there before me. I know your cost base is lower than mine. So congratulations to you. But um, it's it's been a it, it's been a really fascinating company to dive into and one that. I'm excited to own clearly because I, I own shares. So, so there's been two two big um, announcements in the past couple of weeks. Uh, certainly, I don't think it's priced into the stock yet, but hard to know. Uh, one was they announced uh, or, or launched flights in the UK, which makes me think because for anyone that's not familiar with the CEO of Uber, it's Dara. I can't even pronounce his last name, but he came from Expedia. He was the former CEO of Expedia. So he knows the travel industry very well. So that kind of makes me think that's where Uber wants to go, this super app, you know, in everything transportation. And then the other announcement was today, they announced that they're launching their the car sharing service in Toronto and Boston. So I'm wondering if that car sharing service is going to be more like Zipcar, where it's company owned cars, but then they said peer to peer. Which makes it makes me sound it's more like Toro or Get Around. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that that goes back to I didn't actually know that that piece of news from today. So that yeah, can... I, I just came today, and I'm like, I I didn't know this was coming. Like this doesn't make any sense, but it it shouldn't cannibalize them because like if you if I want to go visit my parents an hour and a half away, I'm not going to Uber it down there. Like I'm going to rent a car. So I guess Uber just wants to touch everything transportation, and you know if you need to rent a car, like it's not going to cannibalize the fact that you don't now you're not now, now you don't need an uber ride because i think they they serve different purposes yeah it, it's a great point and i think that they had they, they sort of have earned the right to expand into these new product categories because they've gotten their margin profile in such better shape because they've gotten their balance sheet in such better shape by, by selling off maybe some middle eastern a- assets that they didn't need to own entirely so I, I think that they've just gotten the cost base to such a more healthy place that they can actually look ahead to, to incremental unique value value creation to to, to separate themselves from these more monoline business segments like Lyft in, in North America and, and and elsewhere. And I think the other really compelling piece piece of news and evidence of, of them just going about growth more responsibly is that they're now partnering with Waymo on on and they were already partnered with Waymo on freight. So this was more of an extension of a partnership and not a brand new one, but doing so within all of their product segments now instead of um, and, and I go back to that really entertaining documentary of, of them breaking laws of of having a, a freight car of uh, driving autonomously when that was very illegal at the time. But um, them, them just saying, yeah, we have this fantastic network. Yeah, we're a verb. Yeah, we have all this brand notoriety, but we don't know how to build autonomous cars. But you know who does know how to build autonomous cars? Google and Waymo. So we will take care of our core competencies. We'll let them take care of theirs and we'll be better together. I, I just think that's such a more compelling path. So I'm sure you've thought of this and people probably asked you if 
if autonomous driving really exists in five or six years, uh, whether it's Tesla, whether it's a bunch of automakers, uh, do you think that's good for Uber or bad for Uber? So I think the Waymo partnership kind of insulates them from, from the risk because I mean, Google's chasing this, Tesla's chasing this, all these companies that yeah, if, if they wanted to expensively build their network and, and build the, the demand dynamic that Uber has built with their millions of subscribers and, and, and millions upon millions of riders, then that would have been a risk if these companies were willing to start from scratch on the network. But because Waymo is, is saying, again, we'll take care of the, the autonomous tech, don't worry about that. And we want to plug into your brand. We want to take advantage of, of your recognition and unaided brand awareness. I think that really puts Uber in a, in a better position to be the software layer and 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 really the network that these companies plug into. Now, I think Tesla is going to try to do everything on their own um, because I mean Elon Musk is a pretty That's ambitious guy idea. and he's had a lot of success being an ambitious guy. But aside from Tesla, any if you could pick any partner in the space, I think Waymo would be the one, and it's nice to see them working together. Cool. Um, you recently started a position in Amazon. Yes, sir. So I've always said for the last two years, I've said Amazon and Uber are sort of familiar in the way that they spent 10, 15, 20 years investing in infrastructure, logistics, building out this network that nobody else can compete with now because they're never going to spend the money that these two companies spent. And now these companies finally start to you know, get to show investors the benefit of all those investments through free cash flow and Uber and Amazon should both be free cash flow monsters over the next five, 10 years, but I'm sure there's more to it than that. So besides the free cash flow, or you can, you know, can include free cash flow. What what do you like about Amazon at these prices? I do love free cash flow, but you cover that well. So I, I will focus elsewhere. Um, but but really it's a, it's a matter of there are two structural tailwinds that that they have and will continue to benefit from e-commerce and, and cloud computing. Um, AWS and obviously their, their massive 40% share of e-commerce in North America. And, and kind of ideally for me, the, the fearful and greedy, greedy when fearful, um, following in, in Buffett's cliche footsteps. But when, when there are temporary kind of headwinds, slowing those structural tailwinds down, there, there's always sentiment that follows that of, oh, wow, is, is, is cloud computing um, through its, its, its growth cycle? Is, is e-commerce maturing in the United States, which is just a ridiculous argument? And no, it's not maturing. It's still well under a third of transactions and, and still many more use cases to add on top of that. Um, but it, it was really a matter of the, these two really compelling structural tailwinds being discounted a lot more than they should be. Um, and, and throw on top of that, the chat GPT and open AI stuff um, that really created this narrative that Amazon can't compete in, in AI-based cloud, cloud computing. And I mean, they've been in, in investing in Bedrock and, and Inferentia, which is a chipset that they're working on and another training chipset for many, many years. And, and, and obviously Azure and, and Microsoft are, are, I mean, elite, <laughs> elite competition. Satya Nadella is, is, is brilliant. It's a phenomenal company, Google too, with Google Cloud. But there's not going to, there hasn't, there's never been a winner take all on cloud computing um, besides the very beginning when AWS was the only game in town. Um, but there's not going to be a winner take all. And, and to me, the argument that Amazon can't compete um, within AI with its massive balance sheet. Um, with its gigantic treasure chest of first-party consumer shopping data, um, didn't make a ton of sense to me, um, and and I, I think it was a bit overblown. Uh, so, in comparing, when compiling that on top of the fact that these two really powerful structural tailwinds were slowing temporarily, I, it just seemed like a, a, a nice time to pounce um, on the investment, especially because I mean, Andy Jassy was brought in for his cloud computing prowess, for his for his software-based prowess. That that's why he was named the, the predecessor. Um, so, so to say that Amazon is going to have their launch eaten by Microsoft or, or whatever, I, I just, I don't really see that. Um, not, not to mention the fact that the 11% growth guide, um, that they offered, um, or saying, I, I guess growth flowed from 16% to 11%, um, for a month that's really powered by, and, and Azure didn't slow as much, which made a lot of people concerned, but that's really powered by the fact that AWS is catering to the world of startups. It, it is catering to small and medium-sized businesses that are just inherently more fragile across economic cycles than Microsoft and Azure. So of course, its, it's growth is going to slow more, not to mention the fact that ChatGPT and OpenAI have been a wonderful buffer for Azure um, to, to kind of have this just explosion in consumer-based demand to, to offset some of the slowing from sales cycle elongation and all of those cliche terms we've been hearing over the last year. Um, so that's my very long answer of, of why Amazon and why not. If you woke up tomorrow morning and there was an announcement that Amazon was splitting up into two companies 
AWS in one and everything else in the other, would you be happy or sad? Um, I think I'm going to uh, turn off my video for now, if, if that's okay, because the audio is pretty laggy. Do you want oh, to yeah, okay. with you? Am I, is my audio lagging too? A bit, but I think maybe if I turn off my video, it might be better. Okay, I can, I, I'll turn mine off also. Cool. I, I, have, yeah. I have wondered about that. I do think that it is better with uh, with video off the audio. Yeah, the Chit Chat Money guys always had me turn the video off when I would do podcasts. Oh, really? With okay. My I mean, honestly, stuff. I don't think anyone watching this really cares about our faces anyways, so. Yeah, Um. so to answer your question, uh, I, I would I would own both of them. And, and, and I do think, and, and, and we could speculate on, on what this value creation would be, but I, I do think the sum of the parts is worth is worth more than the whole. And, and I mean, you could have some sweetheart arrangements where AWS is the exclusive cloud computing provider for everything oh, yeah. that Amazon Marketplace touches and, and still retain all that revenue. Um, so I, I'm not really rooting for it, um, but it wouldn't be something that would deter me from wanting to have a large position in, in their asset base. I mean, I, I doubt it would ever happen unless the regulators forced it. And I don't think the regulators are in a position to force Amazon to do something like that, you know, without going after all the other mega cap tech companies. And speaking of mega cap tech, I feel like Meta is now back in the meta, mega cap tech <laughs> conversation, you know, after the stock did drop, I think it was 80% maybe from the all time high. And it seemed like, you know, everyone that <laughs> everyone that was a meta believer uh, other than you and a few others probably capitulated back after that Q3 earnings call. And then even Zuckerberg, you know, kind of capitulated the, the next week when he announced the first round of layoffs and, okay, we're going to lower CapEx. So talk to us about Meta. I assume you still have a position, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's it's pushing 10% of the portfolio now. I think it's my largest holding. Um, you, but, but You were adding back in October, November, I assume? I was adding, I was adding at the bottom, but to be fair, I was also adding on the way to the bottom. So I definitely did not time it perfectly and and, and rarely do. Um, but it, it, for, for Meta, it's, it's really a, a matter of it and, and it, it connects to Amazon. It connects to other holdings like, like PayPal of, of just pre, pre these premature dinosaur labels being developed and, and really following price action and really following the sentiment that coincides with price action and TikTok exploding onto the scene and, and everyone thinking that, Despite the fact that that Meta has effectively copied, and 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 you can you can um, say this is annoying, and 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 a lot of people would agree with you, but uh, the fact is that they they really successfully copied Snapchat Stories. Um, they've copied Be Real now pretty effectively. They they are the master at at letting other social media apps kind of almost serve as their guinea pig um, for seeing what features work and what don't, and which features don't, and then kind of borrowing that and and leveraging their their massive user base. But through through all of this. It's really been um, a, a matter of, of two things. One, the the absolutely crazy opex that was coinciding with um, with the metaverse and with Oculus that they've now greatly pulled back on, and um, and, and the second thing is that transition to Reels and, and how um, Reels monetization kind of is well, it's still lagging um, compared to Stories, compared to Feed, but they've gone through several of these evolutions in the past and kind of using putting our history hat on and, and seeing how. Um, there was there was some stock volatility and, and some questions about the business model as they morph from um, feed based to storage based monetization and a few other um, maybe from mobile um, or from web to mobile and, and figuring out how to monetize the mobile channel. Um, but there's always been these rough patches in in those evolutions in those transitions that that it, that's taken them a little bit of time to figure out, but they've always figured it out. And just just the ads, um, or, or the hints and, and the green shoots coming from. First of all, pivoting all of those op OPEX dollars from metaverse to AI and addressing the IDFA or, or app tracking changes that, that Apple put in place that really affected them. Um, but a, a lot of evidence in terms of um, closing the monetization gap and, and, and closing the, dis the, discovery, um, the discovery algorithm gap that IDFA left behind where they couldn't borrow data from other apps. But now um, they, they, they've used AI al algorithms to really effectively address that gap and to start being able to to measure and, and to be able to report return on ad spend that that's quite compelling again, um, and it's been a, a nice ramp up. But that paired with the fact that I, I really am confident that they'll continue to figure out how to to monetize reels better and better, and they've reiterated that it's going to stop being a cannibalistic revenue headwind by Q4 over and over again. Um, and I mean now, I mean everywhere you look, it's 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 one. I mean, I think Morgan Stanley came out with a note. It was today or yesterday on 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 reels continuing to take share from TikTok. Um, to a point where um, you could you could think of whatever you want about TikTok, and I probably shouldn't get into the politics of the decision, but it, it's oh, really not relying on. So, it, sorry, go ahead. No, I said feel free. I mean, I oh, 
I, th- um, I think t- I think TikTok is going to be a a hot debate topic in the upcoming you know presidential and I mean I, what you know it's election season and there's going to be a lot of politicians talking tough on China and uh, TikTok might be a uh, I don't know they might get stuck in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, in Montana, it might I mean, be collateral damage. <laughs> yeah, Montana first state to ban it. Yep. Um, and I mean, a lot, a lot. There's a lot of momentum in public sectors across states um, banning it, and in, in, I think a couple dozen at this point now. But Montana was the first to actually ban it um, statewide, and I guess they use geofencing or whatever to to enforce that. But um, it, it's a combination of, of all of that, and, and and having belief in the fact that. And, and using historical data to have that belief, not just believing, but that Meta can address the monetization gap and, and the advertising reporting and, and measurement gap um, that, that was left behind by both um, by both Apple and TikTok forcing their hand with Reels and that content transition. And also the fact that people did not believe that that Zuck or Zuckerberg cared at all about what, what investors thought. He, he They thought he's going to do whatever he wants to. It doesn't matter what macro looks like. He's going to spend as much as he wants to. And I think that opinion really came from Zerp in, in, in a time period where money was free and, and people didn't care about profits. They cared about more revenue growth and, and going to, to chase that growth and, and chase that expansion. And it was a very abrupt pivot from revenue to profit where Meta wasn't really prepared to say, OK, yesterday we're going to spend like crazy on the metaverse and today we're going to cut our OpEx. Um, and I think they've, they've cut it three or four times now very meaningfully with via layoffs and, and via cost rationalization. But it, it didn't make a ton of sense to me that 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 Zuckerberg was unwilling to evolve with with changing macro and changing times. And I mean, uh, hindsight twenty twenty, it, it it turned out to be right. But um, yeah, it, it was it was a a very large dose of of sentiment following price action and just this perfect storm of headwinds of TikTok of IDFA of the pandemic accelerant leading to a growth hangover in, in 2022. And even now where they're pretty flat right now. Um, but the monetization gap that they that they've rapidly addressed within reels, um, the the headway they've made within AI for for creating a more discovery based um, social media page where people are spending a lot more of their time because AI is showing you a lot more content that you watch. And for me, anecdotally, I mean, reels and and, and Instagram, they know I wanna I wanna watch golf videos that make me laugh, and, and that's pretty much all they show me at this point. Um, so that's I guess that's just very anecdotal news of. Of, of the the algorithms being effectively seasoned and starting to work but but yeah it, it was it was a perfect storm of, of bad things happening to meta where people were ready to just come off as, as and with half of the world on their apps and still growing in their most mature app of facebook and their most mature region of north america through all of that um it, it seemed overblown a bit like amazon if if zuck asked you tomorrow hey brad do i keep spending on the metaverse or do i you know scratch my plans for the metaverse and use that capital for buybacks or other growth growth initiatives. What are they spending a year on the metaverse? And does that, when they give like their number for, you know, like their CapEx, does that include, is the metaverse and reality labs, Oculus, like, is that all in one bucket together or do they break it out? Yeah. So reality labs is, is a reporting segment and then family of apps is their other reporting segment. So um, in terms of breaking out like the headset operating losses, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they were pretty hefty and, and in the billion dollar range um, when they were launching Quest 2. And, and I, I'm sure it's going to be um, something along those lines in Quest 3. But I guess I'm one of the one of the people who still sees maybe real use cases coming from this. And I think the, the Apple headset, and, I, and I, I saw you talking about this a bit, the Apple headset is sort of almost like, well, it's either an insurance policy of them saying, well, if, if this is actually real, then we want to be part of it. But it's also them kind of uh, offering a vote of confidence in, in, in the billions in cash burn that Meta's endured for building out this, this headset actually could lead to some viable use cases in the future. And, and I think Meta's aim is, is sort of, well, a- Apple Apple does not need to sell hardware at cost because they have bi- a billion plus installed devices in their network. They have this wonderful app business and software and services-based business. But Meta can kind of be this um, and I was talking to Supreme Bagholder on Facebook, which a funny handle, but a really smart guy, um, talking about how Meta is kind of going about this in the open open ecosystem, sell the hardware at cost to generate as much traffic as we possibly can. And, and once they get to their goal of hopefully a billion devices, then the developers will follow and, and they can sort of monetize that traffic via app store take rates, via ads, um, it, like they do everything else. Um, and, and sort of om- almost like WhatsApp. Um, but but several years behind, and that WhatsApp is finally starting to monetize with with 
partnerships with Uber and, and Mercado Libre and, and all these, these compelling companies. Um, and I think Meta is going to just, they're, they're going to accept these operating losses and they're going to be pretty hard to pallet, but not as hard considering the family of apps is, is in a much better place now than it was 12 months ago to kind of feed those investments. Um, but Meta is really going to go about this in a flood the market. And I'm quoting Supreme Bag Holder because we had a fascinating conversation, but flood the market with um, commoditized hardware um, so that you can get all the traffic on your platform that that isn't going to be on Apple inherently, um, which there will be a lot of traffic on Apple because it's Apple. Um, but flood, flood the market with hardware and then figure out how to monetize it later. Um, so I think if they can be part of that next computing platform wave, um, it, it really it, it really provides them a, a lot of opportunities to create new high margin revenue streams to offset these really high operating expenses. But I, I will say the caveat is that, I mean, to me personally, wearing an, a Quest 3 or, or wearing a Vision Pro is, is, is really uncompelling right now. And it will continue to be uncompelling until they look like a pair of sunglasses or a pair of glasses instead of a pair of ski goggles that I have to plug into an external battery pack. Um, so several iterations, several years away from what this is actually going to look like if it ever becomes ubiquitous. But I think there's actually a chance that that it, that it could be real, that the technology could be pretty mainstream at some point, just not now, not next year, but long term. I mean, I think the bigger goggles are all right. You're just not going to leave your house wearing them. You know, yeah. if they expect people to like wear these outside in the airports, uh, business settings, like I agree, they have to be much smaller. Uh, but, you know, if I'm going to watch a movie at home or, or a sporting event and I want that, you know, better 3D immersive experience, you know, I'm willing to throw the glasses on for a couple hours to do that, uh, but, but, but not leave the house. I agree. I mean, and I do think eventually the price will come down. Uh, the size of the goggles will come down. Um, I'm just, I mean, I never, like, I never intended to get the, the Meta Quest glasses, but I will definitely consider the Apple Vision Pros when mm. they're available. But it's like you said, it's all going to depend on what apps are available and what sort of experiences can I have. They better be good to justify a $3,500 price tag. Absolutely. And, and I think we're entering this probably five-ish year period of, of Apple and Meta just stealing each other's best features and copying it for their own <laughs> next generation of hardware. Um, so we'll kind of see where it shakes out when when the technology has been miniaturized enough and, and the, um, to, to actually be compelling to the masses. And, and, and what you're saying makes a lot of sense. I mean, Quest sold 20 million units. So clearly- That's er wild. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know it was that high. Huh. Yeah. So so th there's demand there. Um, I don't understand why the demand is there, but um, there is demand there. I'm, I'm not a gamer, so that, that really might be it. Um, but yeah, I think we're far off from it being needle moving for Meta or for Apple. But the probability of it being needle moving to me becomes a little bit higher with Apple acknowledging that, yeah, this could potentially be real. Um, other big positions, I'm just trying to think about your write-ups. I know you've written a lot about uh, Trade Desk. Yeah. I assume that's still a big position for you. Yeah. So I, I love, I love the company. I, I love their positioning. I love their moat and I don't use the term moat lightly. I, I think it's overused, but they built one here. Um, and, and the major caveat is it's extremely expensive and, and I've been trimming um, gradually recently, but um, basically they, they are, they are, it is, it is walled gardens, um, walled garden advertising. So um, that'd be um, meta and, and, and Facebook, and then it'd be Google and, and, and search and, and those kind of things where um, they control the end-to-end -end ad bidding process, and and they do everything. Um, and then it's and then it's open internet, and in the open internet um, part of, of that gigantic niche, um, and and, and it, I shouldn't even call it a niche because that hints at it being way smaller of an opportunity that it is. There are demand side, and and, and I and Joan, I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Just for your for your listeners, um, for for their knowledge, there there's demand side which. Um, they bid and, and and they they seek out impressions with maximum return on ad spend on behalf of large agencies and on behalf of large brands. Um, and then there's the sell side, which helps publishers kind of um, place this demand in, in the most efficient way possible and, and do something called yield management, which um, essentially just um, ensures that they are placing their impressions in an optimal manner. So Trade Desk really at this point is is the by far the biggest in town on the demand side which the margins on the demand side um, are much better than on the supply side, just because of the supply chain dynamics and how much more of the process that Trade Desk is touching. But for them, it's, it's really a matter of two gigantic secular tailwinds that they are enjoying right now. Um, it's, it's CTV and, and that transition from upfront advertising buying, which is you buy several million impressions several months in advance from CBS or ABC, and you cross your fingers and hope that they work, or programmatic advertising in, in, within an open bidding format where you know exactly who's going to see that impression, you know exactly which eyeballs you're targeting and, and which eyeballs 
are going to end up um, connecting to those dollars that you're spending. And then you can kind of quantify what those eyeballs are worth to you on a, on a single impression by impression basis to make sure that you are spending as, as efficiently and rationally as possible. And that's really what Trade Desk helps you to do. So I should call them the Trade Desk. I, I don't, it, it's annoying that there's a the on the front of desk, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so CTV, I mean, perfect storm of tailwinds. You have HBO embracing ads, you have Netflix embracing ads, you have Amazon now saying on Amazon Prime, we're going to embrace ads, which they have their own DSP demand side platform, but they're inherently going to have to embrace open bidding in order to get maximum CPMs or cost per impression so they can fund their content. Because I mean, streaming content is is very expensive, um, not to mention the fact that the, the, the archaic, I, I shouldn't call it archaic, the uh, the business model within search and other areas that 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 has very little fragmentation and, and, and very high concentration. So Google is is the dyna- is the I don't even know what I'm trying to say. They are there. They own the market, so they can kind of do whatever they want. They have a supply side arm. They have a demand side arm. They do their own reporting. They say, "Trust me" on, on the return on ad spend, and 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 that works for them. But there's no one within CTV that has that market share. I mean, Netflix I think is at eight or nine percent of streaming hours, and 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 they are along with YouTube. They're kind of one and two, and and YouTube's with Google as well, obviously. But um, but yeah, tra- Trade Desk is in a perfect position to operate in this market that needs open bidding in order to, to fund and, and rationally fund this content spend that they all have to continue um, enduring. Um, so so all, all, these, all these companies are kind of embracing ads at the exact same time. Disney and Disney Plus is another one that happened at the exact same time, um, which they actually signed a, a direct partnership with, with um, the Trade Desk. But even in the case of Netflix, where they're working with Xander and they're working with Microsoft, again, they have to embrace open bidding. They have to invite as much um, demand side um, demand side bidding as they possibly can to juice impression just because, I mean, inherently, if you have 20 people bidding on an impression versus 10, you're going to get more money. Um, and, and the value that they're getting by having this always signed in um, streaming kind of environment where I know exactly who I'm talking to make, makes it so that there's this win-win of the demand side being willing to pay a lot more um, and the supply side getting, getting all, all, all of that extra value, but the demand side still coming out ahead on return metrics because these dollars are just so much more effective. So that CTV branch is, is or CTV growth factor is really compelling alongside retail media where they, they can now literally say, okay, Walmart, talk to your advertisers and get this dollar from them. And you can say, okay, Walmart, which they built a custom platform for them. Um, Walmart can tell their advertisers, you spent this dollar and it led to this sale. So, so the, the, the granularity of, of advertising within retail, even in brick and mortar settings, which has been completely absent this for, for the history of advertising, you can actually now get in brick and mortar settings and offline settings, understand exactly um, what each ad dollar led to and, and what each ad dollar um, made you in, in, in terms of profits. And I mean, Jeff Green, who, who's one of my favorite founders and CEOs, and he certainly paid handsomely, so he better be a phenomenal leader. But the CEO of Trade Desk always says, and I think this is a, a say, an age old saying of, um, yeah, I know half of my advertising works. I just don't know which half of my advertising works. And right. now they actually get to understand which half of their advertising works. So um, not, not to mention the fact that AT&T, a- ATT or, or the app tracking uh, legislation that Apple passed and IDFA on the cross, um, cross app data sharing, um, it made signaling a lot harder for all of these companies. And it made it so that they needed this data aggregator to, to bring all this first party data and to bring all this third party data in so they can build enough scale to, to have enough information to be feeding these algorithms to, under, to, to understand efficacy and to understand how well things are working. And, and Apple and Google, Google with their third party cookies aggregation kind of did this as well, but they both kind of made that a lot more difficult for, for companies and inadvertently, I think, pushed them closer to Trade Desk and pushed them closer to this open internet aggregator, which is merely feeding their growth. So, I mean, they've continued to compound through all of this uh, and they grew 20% year over year last quarter, which is very slow for them. But I mean, when you compare it to anyone else in the space, they are, they are taking share by leaps and bounds. Um, and I say all this really exciting stuff and then I have to add a caveat at the end. It is very expensive. We're talking about peg ratios. They are well over two, which I mean, the, the Peter Lynch... Um, cookie cutter point of view is anything over two is very expensive. And, and I agree in this case that it, it is priced pretty handsomely. And obviously I trimmed and then a bank came out and, and said amazing things about them and set a $90 price target and made me look silly, but that always happens. <laughs> and that, that's okay. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's the, that's the trade desk pitch that uh, was probably way longer than you wanted it to be. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it, it's a company that I know I've done a write up on it, but I mean, you certainly know it way better than me and I've never actually owned the stock. I've sort of 
kept waiting for it to get cheaper and cheaper until it was, you know, sort of cheap enough for me, but it just never really got there. So I agree. It's great company. Um, who, who's number two in their category? Who is number two in their cat? That's, that's a, that's a great question. There, there really are not any other demand side, open aggregate, open internet aggregators that come anywhere near their scale. I know. So Magnite and Pubmatic are, they, they handle a lot of a lot of volume and, and a lot of publisher activity, but that's on the supply side. Okay. And really on the, on the demand side, um, Beeswax was, was one that I think, or I don't even know if it was called Beeswax, but something um, that Comcast bought and, and integrated into their own system. Roku has a DSP, um, but there's not this kind of open open demand side player that just aggregates and plugs you into all channels. Um, so and, that's and- one reason that they do trade at a premium. Yeah, they they I, it's it's hard to call, you can't call them a monopoly. Um, and I know you're not trying to, but because Google and because these massive walled gardens also have or represent even more by by far more volume and more demand that they do. But within that open internet niche, they sort of own it on the demand side. No, I know uh, stock that I got into three or four weeks ago because I felt like it had finally bottomed out, and if they could start to reaccelerate growth with a new management team, uh, cut some costs, you know, the stock could could rebound from here. And that's Match, Match Group, M-T-C-H. Uh, you own the stock, I, I believe? Yes, sir. What do you think about Match? Uh, did everything I <laughs> everything I just rattled off? I mean, does that kind of make sense to you? Plus the CEO just bought some stock. I mean, what, what could the next couple of years for Match look like, assuming they can get a couple of their best, um, their best platforms growing again, that being Tinder and Hinge? Sure. So, um, I don't want to sound mean, but the old leadership team was quite incompetent. Um, <laughs> gigantic random acquisition of HyperConnect for $2 billion that they've written off a large portion of at this point. Um, not not shipping. Um, what, what did HyperConnect even do? HyperConnect has, they, it's like a, a, they have Hakuna and Azar. They do like video streaming and um, it's sort of like Twitch almost in, in Korea. Uh, um, and, and, and they have, they do have some dating app functions, but it's really, it was really, a distraction for them. It wasn't their core competency. It wasn't their bread and butter. And they've done so well with these tuck-in acquisitions, um, M&A for dating apps. I mean, Hinge was doing 1 million in revenue when they bought them. I think they're going to do half a billion this year. And so they, it, just, it was frustrating that they didn't stay in their lane, but selfishly, it sort of opened the door for me to kind of get aggressive. And, and They also got Tinder at a really good price, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> they, they, they've been phenomenal. They, they, they've been phenomenal serial acquirers. So pairs in Japan was another home run for them, which um, the pandemic has kind of weighted down a little bit recently, but um, it, that's the share leader in Japan. And they've been a big part of making that the case. Um, so so they, they've really been a, a part of this evolution to um, older style dating apps like match.com, which they also own. And they've really kind of been been this lion share, share taker uh, of these new swiping apps and, and the newer age apps where they have over 50% share of, of the global online dating sector, which is going to grow at, at a CAGR of about eight or 9% for the foreseeable future. I mean, humans are only getting more and more isolated and, and maybe a little bit more awkward. Um, so we all need the, we all need these apps to meet people. And that's where Match comes in. But really, it, 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 it was a matter of, and right now, the first, second, and third most important thing for Match Group is, is, is writing the ship at Tinder. That drives all of the profit. I mean, it, it comes with a 50% EBITDA margin just because of the organic virality that it's, that it's enjoyed. Um, and, and the fact and the matter is that, that the old team was not shipping product and not shipping innovation nearly as fast as they needed to. In the words of Bernard Kim, who came from Zynga, who had a lot of success there, they were just not getting enough shots on goal. And, 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 they, and so when things failed, it, it was bad that they failed because there wasn't a second, third or fourth option to, to replace um, that, that failed experiment with a successful one. So they've really re- ramped up um, the product iterations, the split testing, um, they've they've um, debuted um, new subscription tiers. They've debuted weekly subscriptions that are really starting to work. And, and the evidence is finally coming in in a, a chart that they showed last quarter of April revenue trends at Tinder really exploding higher. Um, and fortunately, they gave an investor conference a few weeks ago where they said, yeah, that happened all throughout May too. Um, so that that is very in- encouraging. I mean, it's hard to overemphasize how important and how needle moving Tinder is to the entire business. Um, but through all of this, Hinge continues to, to kind of grow unabatedly and, and very rapidly. Um, they continue to successfully expand into international markets and climb into top three share positions without much marketing at all. Um, so Hinge is very healthy. Um, they just bought the league, which, um, which I, I'm, not, I'm not super excited about. 
Um, it, it's more of an exclusive dating app community and a higher price point, which I, I, I don't think is going to be that vital to the investment. But what is vital to the investment is that Tinder um, reaccelerates that. I think they're they're targeting about 10% growth by the end of the year and more acceleration thereafter. And that really needs to happen. And, and the fact that um, the revenue trends that we've gotten updates from April and May are coming in where they are is very encouraging. And then you take the fact that they're trading at about, I don't know, they have the exact number in front of me, but they're trading um, at a very low double digit earnings multiple. They're going to buy back about 10% of their outstanding shares with the current buyback program. And they're going to earn, and, and again, I don't have um, the actual uh, market cap in front of me, but I think it's like an eight, nine, $10 billion company somewhere in there. And they're going to do eight or $900 million in free cash flow this year and continue meaningfully growing that going forward. So if Tinder is not a dinosaur, if I'm right in online dating, is not going to, for some reason, just vanish and go away. Um, this could really work. And if I'm wrong, then it's not going to work. So um, that that's kind of that's kind of where I see Tinder and Match Group. Is Tinder in China? Um, I don't think they have any any business in China. Um, I'm not sure if China would even allow that to... I don't think they will. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah too no, controlling. It, it, it is pretty global at this point, but um, still a ton of that revenue comes from North America and, and the, almost all the rest of it comes from Europe. Um, so... Yeah, so Mark, I'm just looking. Market cap on Match is up to 10.8 billion, but that's also because the stock is up 21 uh, percent in the last month. And talking about stocks that are up a lot in the last month, this next one is going to hurt me a little bit because I've been waiting to get back into the company, and then it took off 50 percent in the last month. Uh, that would be SoFi. So, well-run company, good CEO, guy likes to buy a lot of his own stock, which is always nice. Uh, but you had the banking situation and then you had the, obviously the student loan moratorium, which has been going on for two or three years, it feels like. Um, what has sparked the stock price? I mean, is it the fact that the, the FOMC might be pausing, so we may not see any more bank failures, so any of these assets on balance sheets may not be a problem? Or is it just people kind of, they got so pumped up about the debt ceiling and the fact that now we finally have a like a, a sunset to the moratorium. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's been a, it's been a, a dog to own for a while, but fortunately not so much um, recently, but um, there were, there were a few things leading to that kind of panic that I think about them in, in, in the mid fours or something like that. Yeah. But um, it was um, the fact that they, they, they didn't have any whole loan sales of, of personal loans in their, in their last quarter freaked people out and, and said, and made people come to the conclusion that, okay, there's just no capital market demand. But to that, I would say um, they had an asset-backed securitization deal in, in Q1 that was eight times oversubscribed at, at significantly better spreads than they've had in Q3 and Q4. And, and always asset-backed securitization markets are more fickle, more volatile, more hesitant amid poor macro than whole loan markets. I mean, just inherently so. Um, so the fact that they were tapping into one so meaningfully, um, the argument that they couldn't tap into the more durable demand source in capital markets at the same time, just didn't make a ton of sense. Um, but along, along your lines of, of re this, this debate of realized losses and, um, and, and, and loan accounting. So SoFi doesn't account for loans um, in, in a typical way so that they, they do, they don't, they don't do current expected credit losses that, 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 that's that, that legacy way of accounting for loans um, is not how they do things. And, and instead they use a third party firm um, to mark to market uh, loans that are that are held for investment or held for sale, um, and and they kind of incur those those um, implied losses or gains through the income statement or through the balance sheet um, as as those as as those valuations fluctuate and, and at, yeah as they go up and down. So that that really uh, led a lot of people to um, kind of saying, well, um, the the change from um, held for sale or held for investment accounting regulation and, and all these things could lead to a lot of pent up unrealized losses on their on their book. Um, but again, uh, to that, or the counter argument is that, um, first of all, their credit niche is extremely affluent. So they serve a FICO well over 750, average borrower income well over $150,000, and they don't deviate from that credit box. They're extremely conservative lenders, which um, which to me, it's impressive that they've been able to grow. I, I, I was surprised by that. I, I thought they were more targeting like millennials. So I was surprised that their their average borrower had such a high credit score and high income. Yeah, they're and you're right. Um, their client base is pretty darn young, but they 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 do um, a very intentional intentional job of, of seeking out the more affluent and and, and the more um, yeah I guess affluence the good word to use there uh, the, the the more affluent client base, which um, that that leads to two things. One, it leads to the fact that their unrealized losses and their charge offs and their delinquency rates have remained well below uh, pandemic levels, 
And the other thing is it, it inherently creates pricing power because um, their, their sensitivity to rate, rate rises and, and higher costs is inherently lower than for less affluent individuals, which that's led to their weighted average coupon being raised at a, at a pace far faster than the Fed funds rate, which really insulates them against unrealized losses when you pair that with the fact that the repayment rates remain really healthy. Um, and, and so um, Noto is, I, and Anthony Noto, who agrees, great CEO, um, in my very biased opinion, obviously, but he was asked about that in a recent management conference, um, saying he was asked about first the, the lack of full loan sales. And his answer to that always is we're going to maximize return on equity. And we have, the ma- we have the flexibility to maximize return on equity because our leverage ratios are in such good shape. And because we have such rapid um, rates of deposits inflows coming in to fund these originations in a very low cost and very profitable way for SoFi. And, and the other thing is that this whole... Um, drama with unrealized losses, the, 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 the way they account for their loans inherently means that there are no pent up unrealized losses because they're incurring them on their financial statements every three months. Um, so, so on, yeah, so th- those are the two um, really concerns that have abated recently and then add that um, fuel on the, on the fire in, in terms of the student loan moratorium um, now ending as part of the debt ceiling agreement and the fact that they're, they, they have a pretty pretty significant business there where it was by far their largest revenue contributor and by far their largest contribution profit contributor um, before the moratorium. They, and, and they've still pretty gracefully compounded and expanded margins during that time. But just to give you an idea of the impact, I think I saw some estimate where every billion dollars in eligible refinancing demand is worth about $40 million for SoFi. And Noto came out two days ago, I think it was, maybe it was yesterday, and said there's at, at today's rate environment, current rate environment, there are $200 billion in potential Originations that we can profitably refinance at lower rates. Um, so if if they just get a small piece of that, I think my estimate was about one hundred and sixty dollars in incremental revenue and, and about at a fifty five percent contribution margin, which is very conservative, eighty ninety million in contribution profit, which would have been a forty two percent boost to their contribution profit in twenty twenty two. So just, just a, a very meaningful um, revenue and, and and profit boost. And it, and and I say the important thing about that two hundred billion is it's in today's rate environment and. Um, inherently for these refi products for, I keep saying inherently, I'm going to stop using that word, but um, for, for all these refi products, as rates fall, there's there's generally more demand. There's always more demand to refinance at lower rates because cost of capital falls. And and well, now I can, I, I can um, with better liquidity and better rates, I, I can seek out a better loan term and, and lower my payments. So as we get rate cuts, and, and I, I'm not going to predict when, when those are coming. I mean, um, you have 10 different opinions from 10, or 10 different people, whoever you ask, but that's only going to serve as an accelerant to SoFi's student loan business, which is a great segue into your last question of um, how kind of rate fluctuations impact this business. And that's one of the things that kind of drew me to it is they have such a broad, um, broad set of products and, 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 and such, um, such, I, I guess, such, yeah, such, 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 a, such a broad range of products that their lending book, I mean, they, they've got these variable um, to fix refis that do extremely well in one rate environment. Um, and then in a rising rate environment, because you want to lock in a, a, that, that fixed rate as rates continue to soar higher and higher, um, which is, has been really, really good for their personal loan business, which is why we've seen such explosive growth there. And that's inevitably going to slow down when we get rate cuts. But what happens when that slows down is that that's just going to rev up the engine for student loans and their mortgage business, which they're now, and I quote Anthony Noto on ready to step on the gas pedal for, they purchase Wyndham Capital to kind of shrink origination times and to improve service. And now they're ready to kind of rev up the engine and grow there. So they just have these this, this wide range of product segments that do really well in different macro environments. And that kind of um, minimizes the volatility of the results across macro cycles versus maybe a, a, a less profitable, smaller bank um, like, like SoFi still is. But um, ideally, and, and, and Noda reiterated this yesterday or two days ago, I cannot remember when this, this um, conference happened, but that they're going to be gap net income profitable by Q4. And then that's not going to be a one-off event, but a consistent event that they continue um, to execute on for the foreseeable future. So um, exciting product, their financial services segment is finally starting to approach contribution profit or contribution profitability, which will allow them to accelerate marketing spend there um, and and do so without kind of, um, and and do so while justifying it with a, a more compelling LTV to CAC ratio, which they haven't had in the past. Um, so just a lot of things going well um, for the company, uh, but it's gone from four seventy to, to eight bucks. Um, I mean, and, and look, yeah, I mean the stock's up eighty two percent in the past month, or you know, close to it. I mean, like you said, I think it was uh, I, I just had it on my screen. I think it was got down to like four forty five. Yeah, yeah, everyone just assumed that the Silicon Valley Bank stuff was was going to be the end of them. But if you look at their capital ratios um, for the bank, 
If you look at the re leverage ratio for the company overall, they're in such good shape and so far beyond the regulatory minimums or maximums that, that they, they're, and, and, the, and what I talked about with average coupon and, and really strong payback rates. Um, if you just dove into this business um, and, and instead of saying, well, it's, it, it, it doesn't earn any money yet and, and it's kind of this fintechy, flashy stock. And so obviously it's going to get punished, but um, it, it just kind of got swept up in this cliche uh, baby with the bathwater kind of manner. And, and I do think that SoFi is still um, a baby, <laughs> not the bathwater, but obviously I could be wrong and, and we shall kind of see how that plays out. I mean, it almost feels like the, the bank charter, getting that bank charter long term, it's a very good thing. It, it probably hurt them in the short term because of Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, et cetera. So they're, I yeah. guess they pay the price for that. But I do think it is a good thing long term because it'll it'll lower their uh, their lending costs, I guess, right? By having deposits instead of having to like go out to these warehouses and basically borrow on. someone else to lend it out. Yeah, I think they were paying um, about 6% on warehouse debt um, and they pay 4.2% right now APY in their deposits. So just pocketing that 180 basis points of, of spread just really lets them profitably operate at this elevated APY, but it also helps them um, as rates start to fall and these margins kind of start to shrink, it will help them more, more profitably preserve that 4.2% APY in, in, in kind of yeah profitable and rational manner when maybe the non-banks who, who don't have access to this de cheaper deposit funding, like a Robinhood or something like that, has to lower theirs a little bit more precipitously. Um, so that that's something that I know that the, the leadership team is really looking forward to when rates start to fall and that when not everyone can afford to have a 4% or 4 plus percent APY anymore, SoFi expects to be one of the last to be able to afford that 4.2% APY and to be able to differentiate and even accelerate, hopefully, that $2 billion in deposit additions there. They're eclipsing quarterly, um, even even further beyond that. But um, again, we'll see. And, and I'm speculating a bit. So I sort of uh, I've been asking you, you know, which stocks, <laughs> which stocks you want to talk about, or I guess I've been throwing stocks at you. Any stocks in your portfolio that you're pretty pumped up about right now and have been adding to, or a stock on your watch list? Like I know you cover stocks in your in your Saturday newsletter, the Stock Market Nerd. Uh, that you don't necessarily own. Like I think you covered recently NVIDIA, you covered Lululemon, um, yeah. a bunch of others. Any of those that you don't, and maybe you do own them. I'm not 100% sure what you own. Uh, any any companies that you've been writing about recently or covering that you don't own yet, but but you're close to? Yeah. So, um, and and I can't believe you don't know every stock I own. No, I'm, I'm completely- <laughs> or, and Airbnb. Do, you, do you own Airbnb? I do. I do own Airbnb. Oh, okay. But- Really, so I, I finished in getting a bit personal here, but not not super personal, but a little bit. But I finished my my uh, finance degree um, or my my grad program about eighteen months ago, and that really gave me so much bandwidth to be able to cover way more companies and to be able to cover earnings reports. And really, the byproduct of that has been being able to find and uncover these companies like Uber, where holy sh like sh Nikes, <laughs> their 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 last few quarters were just astronomically amazing. And and while maybe it's time to to, to dive in and see what's going on here. But um, Uber would be a great example of one that, that is pretty new to me. Again, my cost base is, is um, a little bit less favorable than yours, but um, uh, but that's okay. Uh, we're friends, so that's okay. Uh, but um, in terms of companies- Mine, Mine's, uh, I think mine's, see, I, I did add recently on the pullback. So I think mine's, I want to say it's 25 or 26. Yeah, mine's I think like 33 or something like that. Um, but- oh, um, so it's, it's going to 60 in the next couple of years. So I hope you're right. I, I, that would make sooner. a lot of sense to me. Um, but, um, in terms of, I mean, that, that you brought up NVIDIA, wow, that, that, that beat and raise was just historical. I, I mean, oh my goodness. I, know. I, I, I thought there was a typo. I'm like, wait, did they just, they just raise guidance by 4 billion in Q2? Yeah. Like, is that I, even possible? I was hesitant to post the one pager on the earnings report because I thought there's no way this can be correct and, right. and I'm going to have to change it and, and delete it. And, it flashed it was, across the CNBC screen and I'm like, hold on, no. they, they, just, they got to do 11 billion and the estimates are seven. Like, wait a minute, All right, can analysts be that wrong? Is that even possible? Wow. Yeah, I just absolutely incredible. And I was even on Twitter the, the first couple or a day, couple of days before like making fun of the valuation and saying this is ridiculous and and that will that that's why I stay in my lane and and, and don't really short because wow it, it was deserved <laughs> and and congratulations to them but maybe kind of switching gears a little bit and talking a bit about maybe a company in the portfolio that I've got grown more cold on um in a little less 
interested in um, over time. It, it's it's a smaller software company called Olo. Um, you familiar with them? They kind of uh, is it like restaurant? Restaurant yes. POS stuff. Yeah, you're right. So. Okay. So there are two software companies in, in that kind of similar stage of, of maturity. Their business models aren't related at all, but in terms of growth to, to translating that into cash flow and profit maturity, it, it, it's Olo and JFrog are those two software names in my portfolio. Olo, like you said, is within restaurants. Um, JFrog is, is a binary management company. So zeros and ones and software packages and all that fun stuff. But both of them at a very similar times around um, mid-2022 said, yeah, we, we, we see macro kind of turning sour and, and yeah, we understand that we're going to have to prioritize profitability a bit more and maybe pull back on growth spend a little bit more. And, and you saw kind of Olo's rate of compounding and rate of growth kind of fall from 25% to, to 20% to 18%. And in that range right now, while you saw, and, and, and you, and you, and they're still operating at about break even EBIT margins. So you didn't get that much operating leverage from that sacrifice of growth, which was a bit frustrating to me because the messaging from JFrog was so similar and, and you saw them kind of preserve um, their compounding rate a, a bit more gracefully while, mar- while while margins exploded higher and while they offered long-term targets pointing to a 30% plus cash flow CAGR for the next several years. Um, so so they they were in very similar strategic positions and JFrog is kind of in is kind of its growth has been a bit more resilient while its margins have exploded higher. And that's kind of what I wanted to see from Olo and, and really didn't. Um, they did lose Subway as, as a, a customer, and that's that's really impacted their net revenue retention rates, which made me a bit more nervous. And then the other thing that's making me a bit more nervous is I bought this company as, as a consumption-based software firm w- w- with a SaaS element to it as well. Um, I, I didn't buy this company thinking it was going to be a payment processor um, with lower margins and, and more commoditization and, and, and naturally a lower multiple that's going to be assigned to that business. And Olo Pay, which has been, to their credit, just a phenomenal success for them and has grown really rapidly and exceeded their targets every single quarter. That is kind of becoming the most exciting part of this investment and, and, and the most exciting growth factor for this investment. And, and in my mind, you, you can't preserve 70 plus percent gross margins when you're morphing into a payment processor. I mean, look look at Shopify and and, and, and where their gross margin has kind of gone over time. Um, and that is, it's related to Shopify. Shopify are they still like 50% gross margins? Yeah, it should it should kind of approach 55, 60% now that they've finally um shedded that um fulfillment nightmare that they were working on. Okay. Um, but payment uh, processing has been a big, big part of their margin contraction as well. Um, and I've kind of tolerated that because Shop Pay and, and all these products have done so well for them in terms Shop of Shop Pay's gotten much better too. Yeah, Shop Pay's gotten much better. The Shop app, which is their personal shopping companion, and I'm using air quotes because that's what they call it. It's top 10 on the app store and and overall, I think it, it passed TikTok and and Instagram for a few days. And, and obviously Harley was, was pounding his chest and celebrating that, which is why, I, which is why I know, and I'm sure they're below TikTok and, and Instagram again, and, and will be most of the time, but it really was this combination of um, strategic priorities, not leading to the kind of margin expansion that I wanted to see. And then also this investment case morphing from a very high margin um, software based firm to something that is more intersecting in the world of payments which will be much lower margin and, and much tougher business to come by, even though they've been so successful with chasing it recently. Um, so I, I sold, um, I think, 50% of the position um, just, just for, for this reason. Um, you, you talking frog or Olo? Oh, Olo. I, I, haven't, I haven't touched it. Uh, yeah, JFrog is, um, they're executing it and I'm a big fan of the team and, and they've done a great job. But, but Olo, I sold 50% of. It was it was last month at some point. Do they, do they compete directly against Toast and Shift Four has their product and Square has some stuff? Like, yeah. are they all competing against each other? Yeah. So, um, those those products that you mentioned are more SMB leaning. So, Toast. I mean, it seems like every restaurant, every non chain restaurant I go to is now using Toast. Which yeah, for real. I got some anecdotal evidence, but. Olo is really, um, they're, they're catering to the um, gigantic enterprises. So Jack and oh, okay. Box, so Applebee's, um, they oh, had sure. some, they lost them and, and Wingstop and Shake Shack and, and these chains. And, and they're, they're really, what, what, what was so compelling to me, which is again, why I'm kind of confused why their margin profile hasn't improved a lot more quickly than it has, um, is they, they sign these enterprise deals at, at the very top level. They, they sign um, they, they sell modules and they sell into every single franchise location in one pop, which is a very efficient go to market that they've been able to take advantage of. Um, but I, I guess you, you could say that maybe the pandemic accelerated their business a lot and, and, and they're slowing down because of that. But 
if you look at restaurant spending trends, they've been quite resilient um, throughout oh, yeah. all of this. And, and it's been a lot of trading down from maybe fancier restaurants to fast casual brands. And that is all those bread and butter. That is where they live. That is where they succeed. That is where they thrive. So it, it's just, um, the story is really good. It, it just wasn't really translating in, into what I wanted it to. And even as I say this right now, as I talk through this, I'm, I'm even almost tempted to sell the other 50%. Obviously, if readers are listening to this, you'll, you'll be the first to know if I do. But do it. Um, whenever your gut tells you to do it, it's usually the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, but but yeah, it's just been, it's, it's been a bit disappointing and I do, I do know the, the, the CEO kind of personally. So, um, I'm, I'm sorry if he's listening to this, I just have to be real. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> I mean, it happens. I mean, we all get emotional with stocks. I mean, there are, there are stocks that I've sold that I hold on, that I either held on to, to too long because I thought the investment thesis might kind of come back, even though it was falling apart, like, like Derm tech, for instance, right? Like mm-hmm. I was bullish on Derm tech at one point, you know, going back two years, because I thought what they were going to do with these non-invasive uh, genomics patches was save people's lives, you know, help them mm-hmm. detect skin cancer faster without having to get, you know, without having to, to, to use the scalpel. Um, didn't happen. You know, it was just poor execution by management, burning too much cash, not really getting enough traction with dermatologists and doctors. And the whole thesis <laughs> fell apart, you know, ended up yeah. selling my stock. You know, it was probably down 75, 80% when I sold it. And then it went down another 50 or 60% after that. So it sucks, you know, like, I mean, you can't, no one, you know, we're not going to get, we're not going to be right hundred percent of the time on our stocks, you know, especially yeah. when you, when you own, I mean, I have 30 stocks in my investment portfolio. I know there's two or three in there that are going to suck and I'm going to have to sell them at a loss. That's just the way it works. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's always, it's always the hecklers who, who remember the, the the losers, but I'm sure those same hecklers don't tell you congratulations on getting Celsius. So, so right. Do you own <laughs> Celsius? I I don't. I'm I'm congratulating you. I'm not. <laughs> I know. I know. I know you don't. But I was. I was just kind of. That was my. That was my last question of the day. I was going to ask you why don't. Why don't you own Celsius? <laughs> <laughs> I I even. I mean, I drink their product. I. Oh I, geez. Yeah. I don't know. That that was a swing. You've been, you've been following me long enough. Where you know when I was first pumping it, it was back in the. I mean, it was three years ago. But I mean, even even last year, the stock got down under forty dollars, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, congratulations to you, and and, and I, I mean that that's been that that's been phenomenal. And I mean, talk about blowout quarters. It seems like they have. I mean, last quarter, oh my goodness, and, um, yeah, not and, not quite Nvidia level. B, no, but, definitely not. No, not Nvidia level. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Nvidia is raising four billion, you know, four billion, re- you know, by uh, four billion a quarter in in revenue, and Celsius is just trying to get to a billion total for the whole year. So. Yeah, uh, not quite in the same league yet. But I did I did a post earlier today about Mon- um, Celsius and you know Monster is a sixty billion dollar company now. Like I don't know if people appreciate how big Monster is, and uh, Red Bull would be an eighty or ninety billion dollar company if they were publicly traded. So Celsius at ten billion dollars is still just a small, tiny fraction of the entire industry, which is growing at nine percent a year. You know, and it's going to be a hundred and sixty billion dollar industry in eight, nine, 10 years. And if Celsius can have four or 5% global market share, you know, they could be a $50 billion company someday. So, and that just kind of reminds me, you know, when Jensen Wong said, you know, that something like a trillion dollars of upgrades will have to happen across these data centers in order to get ready for all the extra computing power with AI. Like that makes me think that this, this NVIDIA move is not like, it's not overdone, you know, like there's, there's more to come. Yeah, I mean, for, in terms of semiconductors, that 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 is a sector I put in my too hard pile. Um, yeah. just I, I mean, it's like science fiction to me. I, I can't understand the tech; it it, it is beyond me. But um, so I defer to you on on Nvidia I, in, in that space. I, I don't own any semis for the same reason. I I can't I can't tell you the difference between Nvidia and AMD and uh, Lamb Research. Like I don't know these chips. You know, I I don't know why one chip is better than the other. What makes Nvidia's GPU so much better than someone else's? So if I, I I would buy Nvidia, I think now. So I did recently invest in Super uh, uh, SMCI Super Micro Computer, uh, which has a partnership with AMD and Nvidia. Um, and I'm still learning about the company. I started a one and a half percent position, and I'm digging in now. But uh, I believe that if if everything Jensen Wong says is true, uh, and their GPUs become like the must have product over the next five or ten years to power AI then SMCI will be one of these ancillary winners. 
So, and what sucks is the stock is up 300% over the last <laughs> year, but it's still only trading at like 25 times earnings. Yeah. So like it's still not even an expensive stock. Um, and it's, you know, it's got a market cap of around $10 billion. So, you know, I'm, I'm mad I didn't find it sooner, but I don't want to like sit on the sidelines for too long if I think it can go higher from here. Now, NVIDIA yeah. is a trillion dollar company. So that's a little bit different. Yeah. Wow. Trillion dollar company. Good for, good for Jensen Wong, man. Oh my goodness. I think he owns, I think he owns 4.5% of the company. That <laughs> so works. That works. The worth is still like, you know, top 20 richest guys in the country, probably even with only 4%. Um, yeah. Brad, what's the best place for, for people to find you online? I know your Substack. you're active on Twitter. What are those handles and usernames? Yeah. Stock market nerd for everything. So that's the Twitter okay. handle. And then stockmarketnerd.com is, is the URL for, for the Substack. And I, I appreciate you letting me say that. When you say everything, so Twitter, Substack, are you on any other platforms? Like have you jumped into, into TikTok yet? Not not yet. Um, I, I kind of dabbled in Instagram a little bit, but to be honest, that was only because I had like a two week long shadow ban on Twitter for whatever reason. So I was just <laughs> <a little empty. laughs> what, did, so, what, did, what did you do or what did you say? <laughs> I wish I knew because oh, okay. I wouldn't do it again, but I have no clue. I, I really don't know. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's it's really just Twitter and the, and the newsletter. Um, th- those are the the places where I, I kind of live and work. How's the newsletter going? I know you put out a big newsletter on Saturday morning. How many hours do you put into that? Because I, I mean, I've written plenty of deep dives over the last couple of years. I mean, I'm assuming you put at least four or five, six hours into it. Yeah, oh, the the newsletters the newsletters are almost a full time a full time job, right. even not during earnings season. And then during earnings season, it's like I, there are not enough hours in the day to cover right. as much as I want to. Um, but yeah, because you're, you're listening to the conference calls, you're going through the transcript, right? Yeah, yeah, reading the filings, everything. Right. Um, it, it it takes a while. It's a labor of love, but I mean, in in my mind, the value that I create is is being somebody that hopefully um, listeners and viewers can trust. When for me, when I say things are good or things are bad. And then consuming all of that content and, and kind of tying it in a neat little bow so that they don't have to. Um, now, I assume you have some advertisers or partners that support you. Yeah, yeah, um, advertisers. Um, if you're listening, love love each and every one of you. Um, and uh, yeah, all monetized for the ad. Um, to be candid, and I don't think I've ever said this before, but I, I think I'll eventually um, charge for subscriptions on the newsletter when, when I reach a certain um, kind of critical mass. Um, but as of right now, it's all ads, all sponsorships, all free. Um, yeah. What's the, what's the game plan long term? Like three years from now, you think you'll still be running it? Um, I hope so. I, I really I really enjoy the work. I mean, it's it is a labor of love, but I mean, I love researching companies. So if if I get to do that for my job, um, it's I know this sounds nerdy, and that's why I'm called stock market nerd. Um, but it, it is it is really fun. So I guess end game is just growing this as much as I possibly can, and kind of seeing where it goes and and where it ends up. And um and yeah, aside from that, I'm kind of just um, always just figuring out what works, figuring out what doesn't, tweaking, adjusting, and and and, and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, um, no 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 concrete um, finish line in sight for me. I, I don't know how this ends up. You think you'd ever want to be like an analyst at a firm, um, a fund? I mean, since yeah. you like since you like learning about companies, digging into companies. I mean, not not everyone loves doing that, <laughs> but it's an yeah. important important and then part get- of the process. And then I'd actually get access to a Bloomberg terminal, which would be, which would be phenomenal. <laughs> um, but um, I, I worked at a registered investment advisor for two years, okay. um, kind of right out of college. And, and just, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't do well with busy work. I, I do. I, I get very distracted and, and very frustrated with busy work where I feel like I'm, I've been assigned something and I'm not being productive. And, and um, I just, you go into, you know, you go into wealth management. I was in that industry for a decade. It's like half your day is fucking paperwork and compliance. Yeah. And, 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 and then the other half is holding client hands and making oh, sure they're not panicking. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're like part-time babysitter, part-time therapist. Yeah. So I really love the, I'm going to do all this work and, 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 and develop these opinions and explain to you exactly where the opinion came from. And then you can take that information and do whatever you want with it. I hear um, you, that's kind of where I've yep. positioned myself. If I if I ever started a fund, it would not be like a, you know the, the the classic wealth management where you have to meet with your clients once a week or once a month at their dinner table, go through the portfolio, talk about their financial plan. Like zero interest in doing that. Like I want to spend my time researching companies, running money, building models. Like 
actually trying to make money for my clients rather than wasting my time yeah. <laughs> sitting across the table for them talking sports and weather. <laughs> so Yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, I think everyone on Twitter appreciates what you do. So keep doing it. Uh, glad it's working for you. And I definitely appreciate you coming on the podcast today and, and sharing your insights on some great companies. Happy to, my friend. And thank you again for having me. It was a, a fun conversation. And uh, go Uber. You got <laughs> go it. Uber. I'm actually launched. So I'm launching a Spaces pretty soon. I don't know. What is today? June 8th. Probably in a couple of weeks. It's called Pitch Your Best Idea. Okay. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, we'll have like three people come on. I'll probably do it three days a week. So like nine people a week and they'll have 12 minutes, you know, ballpark to kind of pitch their best idea. So think about what your best idea is. Yeah, I, I will. I will let it percolate. Um, but it's not, that sounds like a fun event. Cool. Yeah, it should be fun. Helps us all find some new ideas. Cool. All right, Thanks, man. Talk to you soon, man. Have a good yes, one. Sir.